These are three examples of paintings that I did over several years and they will give you a contrast of the three impressionisms that we are working with. This here is tonalism. As you can see, very subtle colors. Um, the trees are not individuals, they're groups. What's defining these trees is the brush strokes here and the separation of light and dark. This becomes an American Impressionism. And again, there's additional colors with the red that we talked about. But for the most part, it's overall green and gray and some blue. Even the blue is blue-gray. This painting becomes a little more exciting because of the additional values and colors than the tonalistic painting. From the American Impressionism, we moved to the French Impressionistic uh, movement. And as you can see, the increase in colors. Now, again, we'll go over the palette as we begin to paint, but there's not a lot more colors uh, than where we started. A lot. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Michael Sulo, and welcome to my class. Tonalism was an American invention that used a very limited palette, and the paints, the pigments used, are made to create grays and greens. So to create green, of course, you're going to use yellow and blue and yellow and black. And to create gray, black and white. And also one additional color, which was perhaps sienna. And the reason to use the sienna is to warm up some of the additional tones because an entire green-gray painting is very cool and not very interesting. Tonalist is a very quick type of painting and basically was not invented but created to be used out in the field. When America was new and young, surveyors were sent out in the field to look at the new land, which was not part of America at that time, of course, it was Indian country. And the surveyors would record the land and the hills and the typography, but to make it a complete picture, they sent out artists, landscape artists, and the landscape artists created a very quick and sketchy form of painting, which of course was uh, tonalism. Also tonalism paintings in the end are very suggestive and very beautiful, but areas of trees, for instance, areas of pines, were not described as individual trees. They were made as areas of varying color and varying shades. Aerial perspective was very, very important. And aerial perspective, of course, as you know, is as things are further away, they're lighter because you're looking through more atmosphere and as they come closer and the atmosphere lessens, they become darker to your eye. William Leroy Metcalf was born in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1858. After deciding to follow a career in art, he studied at the Académie Julienne in Paris. After receiving an honorable mention from the Paris Salon in 1888, Metcalf returned to Boston, his home, and established a studio in New York City in 1890. In the 1890s, Metcalf became a teacher, and he taught at the Cooper Union, at the Art Students League of New York, and Rhode Island School of Design. In 1898, he became part of the Ten, a group of American painters dedicated to American Impressionism. The most respectful biographical tribute we can give is to view parts of his life's work, 
Sit back, relax, let the music give you inner peace, and view the paintings of Willard Leroy Metcalf, a master of American Impressionism.
The materials used for this project are relatively simple. We need a 9 by 12 inch uh, canvas, a small canvas, and in the way of paints we have, I'm using here, Prussian blue, titanium white, any yellow, a canary yellow, a lemon yellow, burnt sienna, and any black. One quarter inch brush, flat, one half inch brush, flat, and one quarter inch round. That should do it. Today we'll be visiting Hartness Park to create our painting in the plein air style. It is very important to tone your canvas before you start rather than working on a white uh, surface. Here I'm using an acrylic paint, a rag, a soft rag, and some water and scrubbing on the surface and creating a nice green blue tone. When I paint outside, I try very hard not to make a mess. And so I use, as you can see here, foam plates as palettes. For this project, being a tonalist project, we're using an absolutely limited palette. And so I'm adding titanium white to my palette, Prussian blue to the palette also, lemon yellow, canary yellow, some bright yellow will do, uh, burnt sienna, and lamp black. Tonalist paintings are very American and very simple and so rather than fuss too much with one and two point perspective we use the old-fashioned nine grid here. As you can see we are painting across the uh, canvas and creating a nine grid. This was very popular before the very strict one, two, and three point uh, perspective came into view. The nine grid also allows us the opportunity to choose one of the horizontal lines as our horizon line. And in this case, we're going to choose a low horizon. As you can see, I'm painting in with the sienna, my horizon. The tonal palettes are very strong in middle values and limited in hues. The tonal uniformity creates a calming atmospheric effect. At this point, I've used the black and white and created a soft a gray tone that I'm going to use for my sky. Tonalist painters were very aware of what's known as aerial perspective. 
Now that's not to be confused with mathematical perspective of one, two, and three point. Aerial perspective dictates that as you look at the sky, the top part above your head of the sky is darker, and as you look down towards the horizon, the sky appears to lighten. The same principle holds true for the area below the horizon line. Most things at the horizon line to appear further away would and should become lighter in value. And as you come closer to where you are painting in the canvas, the items that are closer to you in say middle ground get darker value. And as you come into the foreground, the darkest values. In doing so, it creates a feeling of distance. As I work this sky, if you're paying attention to the video, you can see that I am mixing on the palette to get my middle tone gray but I am also mixing on the canvas. There are no rules as far as that goes. Do you do this and that or both or what? You have a lot of leeway in tonalism because the most important thing is to create the soft dreamlike tones of this particular genre. As I work this guy, you can plainly see that I'm working in, aside from the black and white, some blue. And that's to create a cool uh, effect in the sky. And as I work down towards the horizon, I will be adding more white, again, to get a kind of a grade, an aerial perspective grade from the darker to the lighter, keeping in mind that tonalistic painting is not a wide range of tones but a very close soft effect and here again you see i'm adding some more white to the horizon and bringing it all the way across As you can see here, I've picked up some of the brown, but accidentally from our horizon, but that's not a problem because I'm going to mix it into the grays and whites and create a warm part of my painting lower towards the horizon. And here I'm adding some blues into the top part of my painting to create a more cool area of gray. This way I will have a warm, cool contrast. Now my sky is almost completely painted in with many different brush strokes, scumbling and horizontal work and I'm going to use a half inch flat brush clean and dry and just caress the top of this paint so that I blend it down and soften it to create that misty dreamlike feel. Be sure not to push down on the brush and overblend this sky. 
all the brushwork that you have underneath needs to come through and just a softness on the top. My sky is pretty at this point, however, it's a little bit uninteresting. And so today, as I look in the sky, I see some cirrus clouds, and I'm going to take just straight titanium white, load my brush up, and scumble in some very pretty and interesting, I hope, cirrus clouds. Our sky is completed for the moment, and it's time to put in some images of trees or a tree line along our horizon line. Once again, we are not here in this canvas, in this technique, trying to paint willow trees that look like willow trees or oak trees that look like oak trees. What we're doing is creating an idea, a simple idea of a line of trees. With the combination of yellow and blue, I've created a very light and beautiful green which I'm going to use along the back of the horizon and create a group of trees, as you can see, that are part of our background. As contrast to the light yellow green, I will add a little bit of sienna and a little bit more blue and create what the illusion of darker trees closer to us as dictated by aerial perspective. And if you watch, you'll see the darker of these illusionary trees working themselves in front of the lighter trees and coming close to us. The variety of colors, especially soft greens, is amazing with such a limited palette. Using the blue, the black, the yellow, and the sienna.
I am very fortunate today to be painting at Hartness Park. Hartness Park has a magnificent mansion that sits behind this group of trees, behind this tree line. It is my intention to show the roof line of this mansion and just a few other details, not many, as it sits behind the tree line. So here I am boxing in the roof and I will put in some of the chimneys and let the rest of it be covered by the tree line as is the case at Harkness. When you work outside, if the opportunity presents itself, you should try to put in something that you can use for scale. In this case, I'm using, of course, the roof line of the mansion and things that people can use in your painting for scale. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a piece of architecture. It could be a cow a dog, a horse, a fence. Using the darker colors, the dark blue, the Prussian blue, and some of the sienna, less white, I'm going to put, in contrast, a line of smaller vegetation in front of our tree line, again for contrast and to create depth. It's time to put in our large field that we are sitting at the edge of looking deep down into the park. And so I relight uh, the greens, making them much lighter. Again, as we talked at the beginning, this is aerial perspective. So at the horizon, we're going to be relatively light and work our way towards the front of the canvas and grade to a deeper value. Grass, for the most part, as you look out over a large lawn or a field, you will see, especially some that's manicured as this park is, you will see the majority of the color used or seen actually in the field is yellow. There's some yellow, some brown, some green, not a lot. When you paint large expanses of grass or fields, it is important that you put your brush strokes in a horizontal manner. This will create the typography of the land and just the smallest twists and turns will create dips and ditches and very flat areas that make this part of your painting 
interesting. With so much cool color on the base of my uh, painting, I'm going to add some brown to warm up the front of this painting, just for contrast of warm and cool. My canvas is covered, and now I'm going to work on the middle ground. I'm working now, as you can see, with a palette knife, using quite a bit of yellow with some blue, a little bit of blue, and a little bit of green that I had mixed on my palette, and I'm going to cut in a middle ground tree. Once again, this is tonalism. I'm not painting an oak tree or a pine tree or any particular genus. I'm just putting the image of a tree, something you might see in a dreamlike state, or if you're driving your car and peek out the window really quick, the side window, and just get a glimpse of a very pretty, cool and warm presentation of a tree. And that's what we're going to put here in the right side of our painting as a middle ground. To create a contrast of light and dark, I'm using straight yellows on the left-hand side of my painting of this tree because my decision was to allow the sunlight to come in from the left-hand side of the canvas. By using the underside of the palette knife and the edges of the palette knife and some scraping techniques, I can create a very pretty tree with limbs and branches and leaves Part of the fun of painting outside is one gust of wind and you're wearing the paint. We will not be deterred.
With the middle ground just about completed, we're going to move into the other side of the painting and start to work on foreground. In this painting, where I'm sitting is a tree directly overhead. And so I'm going to paint the leaves and some of the branches that I can see right above me. Once again, the aerial perspective dictates that the pieces of your painting closer to you, especially in the foreground, become darker in value. And now, of course, the tree limb that is above my head is also throwing a shadow on the lawn, the field, directly in front of me. And so I'm going to palette knife in the rest of this tree, or the rest of this bough, and create its shadow on the grass. Our tonalist painting is complete, and please join us over the next several months as we explore the fine arts and the techniques of many different genres. Robert Harper Griswold, a ship's captain, had established a life for his wife and three daughters in this beautiful house in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Unfortunately, in 1882, Robert Harper died, and in short order, his wife and one daughter, leaving Florence and her sister Adele in financial straits. Florence did what was acceptable in those days to earn money. She took in boarders into this very large home. In 1899, artist Henry Ward Ranger stayed at the Griswold House and thought it a great place to create an art colony. Henry Ward Ranger encouraged Child Hassan, and Hassan in turn influenced William Metcalf. Soon, other artists came, including Matilda Brown, Wilson Irvin, William Henry Howe, and in short time, a European-styled 
Art Colony was created in Connecticut. Florence converted her family's formal parlor on the first floor into this large bedroom in anticipation of distinguished guests. Of all museums in Connecticut, this one gives me the nicest feeling. Uh, almost, especially here in the dining room, where you can almost feel Florence walk in with breakfast or dinner and can get the warmth of Connecticut, the beauty of this kind of interaction between artists. It has been said of Florence Griswold that although she embraced the idea of managing a rooming house and that she thoroughly enjoyed her guests, especially the artists, there were times when she would lock herself away in her room and in that privacy reminisce and remember her youth when her father assumed the financial and the maintenance of such a large house and provided for the family. This is Edward Simmons, known for being part of the Ten. The Ten were a very famous uh, group of painters known particularly for Impressionism.
A loose group of artists compiled an exhibit that opened in 1898 in New York. Each artist member signed an agreement to exhibit at every annual show and add new members only by a unanimous vote. All members were established artists. The reason for forming this group was to exhibit in a comfortable venue with a select group of like-minded artists with paintings that harmonized together. They became known as the Ten. The original members of the Ten, as they were named, included Charles Hassan, J. Alden Weir, John Thratchman, William Metcalf, Edmund Tarbell, Frank Benson, Joseph DeCamp, Thomas D. Wing, Edward Simmons, and Robert Reed.
completed by William Metcalf in 1914 as part of an entry of the Lawrence Griswold Museum. William Metcalf visited Old Lyme in 1905 at the suggestion of a friend and artist, Child Hassan. Metcalf and his family began summering in Old Lyme in 1905. Unfortunately, in Old Lyme, his first wife Margarita and artist Robert Nespin ran away together creating scandal and injury. This painting, Summer at Hadlime, painted in 1943, features his second wife, Henrietta, and his daughter, Rosalind. After many years of welcoming guests, the house began to show its age. A group of artists took on the project of restoring the house and redecorating some of the rooms at their own expense and with the labor of their hands. A wonderful gesture of love and respect for Florence and all she had provided. study French Impressionism, which is, of course, the most beautiful, most colorful type of Impressionism that uh, I think the world has ever known. We're going to look now at a couple of pictures by Manet, not Monet, Manet, M-A-N, and we'll discover a few things before we start our step-by-step -step, uh, project. The three characteristics of color which are value, hue, and saturation, 
and the simultaneous contrast in shadows. Thank you.